So for today's talk, inshallah, we're going to be taking a break from our series uh, that we started on, our, uh, on living Islam and learning our Aqidah. And the reason why we're going to be taking a break is because there's a very important season that's about to enter upon us as Muslims. Possibly this time tomorrow could be the first night of Dhul Hijjah. So the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah is something of great importance to us as Muslims. And today, inshallah, we're going to be looking at that, looking at some of its virtues, some of its importance, and at the same time, some of the recommended acts that we can do whilst we are here not performing hajj, as many of us, that's going to be the case. So before we start, in reality, it's something that we should all be grateful for. And me in particular, I'm grateful to Allah that he has guided us to this knowledge. Because you find when it comes to Dhul Hijjah and its importance, many people are heedless of this. And it's unfortunate because these are the best 10 days in the sight of Allah out of the whole year. So this is a very important season that we are about to enter. At the same time, you find culturally these days are slept on unless you are actually making hajj. If you're making hajj, then of course they're important. But if you're not making hajj, you stay here at home, then you find that these days are just normal days. And the most that some people will do is sacrifice. But there's no real knowledge and no real spiritual connection to these days and their importance. So the first thing we need to look at is what hajj actually is. And we find that it's from Allah's many blessings upon us that he has made hajj as part of our lives on an annual basis. And we find that hajj is this amazing institute that Allah has placed in our lives and it, and it, and it has many goals and objectives that it wishes to fulfill. From the most important goals is that it's an opportunity for us to strengthen our relationship with Allah. It's an opportunity for us to cleanse our souls and become better people. And you find that the way that Allah does this is that he introduces many different acts of worship into our lives in these first 10 days. And at the same time, he revives many different acts of worship that we already know and, the, and that we're already practicing throughout the year. But he puts emphasis in these first 10 days. And he places and he makes it that if we do these deeds, he gives us many, many rewards. He makes it a blessed time, a time of barakah. From these lessons that we learn and from the ibadat that we perform in the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, and particularly at the time of Hajj, is learning the correct belief about Allah. That we leave everything to worship Him and Him alone and sacrifice everything that we can. And every aspect of Hajj, we learn about the oneness of Allah. Whether that's through the prophets and messengers that passed before us like Ibrahim alayhi salam and his son Ismail. And we follow many of the rituals that they place there for us. Or we learn about the actual ibadat in particular, like the talbiyah for an example. Labayk, Allahumma labayk. Every aspect of Hajj teaches us about the oneness of Allah. And that if we want happiness... In this life and the next, it is our responsibility to fulfill his worship. From the lessons that we learn from Hajj is cleansing our soul and its importance. From them is responding to the call of Allah. Where you find, subhanAllah, many people are heedless of the fact of making Hajj and making Umrah. And other people wish that they could go but subhanAllah, Allah has not decreed that for them and it's not their time. Just today, subhanAllah, there was a hospital visit that I attended and there was an older uncle from the community that was ill. Two of his sons had to cancel their hajj last minute because their father, may Allah cure him and make the affairs easy, has fallen really ill. So you find that no matter what we sometimes may intend and we may 
think this is the time that's it, I'm going for Hajj, I'm going to do this deed. Allah has a greater plan. And sometimes it's not our time to go and fulfill this ibadat. Sometimes it may be that we are not spiritually ready and it takes time. From the lessons that we learn from Hajj is making the dhikr of Allah, remembering Allah frequently. From those lessons is having a tawakkul, complete and perfect reliance upon Allah. But you find when somebody embarks upon that journey, he is literally in the hands of Allah. Where he is in a new land, a new language, new weather conditions, new everything. Gathered with millions and millions of people, he leaves his family behind. Everything is in the hands of Allah. And that's one of the lessons that we learn from Hajj. From those lessons is making a tawbah, turning to Allah in uh, with sincere repentance and we spoke about this last week and from the lessons that we learn from Hajj is remembering our final abode remembering the next life and remembering death and this is done in many different ways from that is the ihram the white cloths that we wear to be equal with everybody else reminds us of the shroud that people are buried in that we're going to be buried in at the same time, gathering on the plains of Arafah reminds us of the gatherings of Yawm Al-Qiyamah where everybody's going to be extracted from the graves and be questioned. So that's from the lessons of Hajj. From the lessons of Hajj is understanding the importance of unity where everybody is united as one ummah, dressed the same in the ihram. Nobody can distinguish one from the other. And it shows us how Islam has come to remove all social ills like racism and tribalism and all these other different diseases that the communities have. From the lessons that we learn from Hajj is disgracing the shaitan by obeying Allah and not falling into the temptations that the shaitan puts there for us. And from the lessons is giving a shukr, being th uh, thankful to Allah and being grateful. And from the lessons of Hajj is sacrifice where we don't just sacrifice and slaughter the animal, but we sacrifice our desires and our whims and that which we wish for that which Allah has decreed for us. It's also important for us to understand that from Allah's attributes is that He creates whatsoever He wills and He chooses whatsoever He wills. He creates whatsoever He wills and he chooses whatsoever he wills. Before we understand, understand what this means, we look at where this comes from. It comes from the ayah in the Quran where Allah says, وَرَبُّكَ يَخْلُقُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيَخْتَارُ That your Lord, he creates whatsoever he wills and he chooses whatsoever he wills. So we learn from Allah's attributes is that he chooses whatever he wills. What does this mean? Who can explain what this means to me? What do you think? Say it again? Don't know. Kothar. Say it again? The question again, for those that weren't paying attention, like Kothar, <laughs> is وَرَبُّكَ يَخْلُقُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيَخْتَارُ That Allah creates whatsoever He wills um, and He chooses whatsoever He wills. What does this mean? Who can give me some examples of what Allah has chosen? He chooses when you go, He chooses certain people and when they go for Hajj. Excellent. What else? Kothar. Allah chooses many, many different things. Fadalahi. Generally. Yeah, okay. So we find that Allah chooses many different things. He chooses certain people, like the prophets and messengers from the whole of mankind. And He chooses them to be the best of mankind and those, uh, and He leaves the example for us to follow and try to emulate to the best of our ability. At the same time, He chooses them. The, the people who speak on his behalf and relay the divine messages to us. 
right? He chooses people in the sense that he has chosen us to be alive. And he has chosen uh, for us to have this ability to gain this reward. He chooses certain places. Before that we find, subhanAllah, there are many people that were preparing to go for hajj or preparing to do ibadat here at home uh, for the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. And Allah decreed that they're not going to see Dhul Hijjah, they're going to pass away before that. So just the fact that we are alive and he has given us this opportunity to benefit from these days, then this is something which we have to be grateful for and make the most of. At the same time, Allah has chosen certain places like, like Mecca for an example. He has placed Masjid al-Haram, his house there and the sacred masjid and whoever prays one salah there is like praying how many? A hundred thousand anywhere else. A hundred thousand anywhere else. He has chosen other masajid and made them the best places. Made them the best places on this planet. And he has given them that great virtue of being called his house. Where its purpose is to establish his worship in many different ways. To serve the local community. Where he's actually worshipped the people gathered together to worship him. With Salah and Juma and other than that. So Allah chooses whatsoever he wills. And he places gives that thing worship, a virtue. Another example of this is sometimes Allah chooses times and he makes them virtuous, like the time of Jummah, the best time, the best day of the entire week. Other times you find Allah chooses months, like the month of Ramadan, and he has made that the best month over the 12 other months. We find that Allah chooses nights, like he has chosen the night of Al-Qadr and made that the greatest night of the entire year. At, like this, Allah has chosen the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. He has chosen the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, which we may be entering upon this time tomorrow. It could be the first of the first night of the 10 days. And he has made these days the best days as we're going to come to learn of the entire year. One of the reasons why this is, who can tell me? The time of Hajj, what else? It's one of the four sacred months. Kothar. Yeah, that's when the Hajj is performed. Akhuna. <laughs> the question is, why is it that Allah has chosen these 10 days to be the most virtuous over the rest of the days? But why? What's the wisdom behind that? One of the reasons that scholars give, and that's correct as well, one of the reasons that scholars give is that it's the only time of year that the five pillars of Islam are being acted upon at the same time. The only time of year. So we find the Tawheed of Allah that's going to be acted upon in every aspect of our lives. Where we worship Allah and only Allah. And then we find when it comes to Salah that's being implemented throughout the year. At the same time you find when it comes to Zakah, people are going to be paying their, their charity money, sometimes to feed the, 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 the qurbani that they make, if it's applicable, or they're going to be giving their zakah anyway because the nisab is come around that time of year. Or some people will delay until this time to get that extra reward. So we've got three. The fourth one is fasting. You find that one of the most virtuous things that you can do is fast in these first nine days, in particularly the day of Arafah. And then of course Hajj, it's the season of Hajj. So one of the reasons why this is so special and so such a great time is because it's the only time of year that the five pillars of Islam are going to be acted upon and implemented across the world at one time, simultaneously. 
with regards to some of the virtues of this month. Before we get there, when we say that this is a blessed time or it has virtue, what do we mean by that? We mean basically, for them. Yeah, you're supposed to do stuff in these times and Allah from his mercy and from his kindness and from his compassion, he places a great amount of reward there. Yeah, we're going to take that. But we find that Allah chooses these times that we mentioned, Ramadan, Laylatul Qadr, the first 10 nights of Dhul Hijjah, the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. It's from Allah's mercy and his compassion that he chooses these days and gives them virtue so that we can act and do righteous deeds and seek his forgiveness and the many different deeds that we're going to mention so we can do these and get a greater reward than doing it outside of this time. The reward is multiplied and that is from Allah's mercy and from his kindness. So we find when it comes to the virtues of these first 10 days, the first virtue that I bring to your attention is that with the Prophet wasallam said, Aftalu ayami dunya al-ashr. The best days of the entire year are the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. The first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. And the reason why is like I mentioned, it's the only time of year that the five pillars of Islam are acted upon at one time. At the same time, it's important that this is it's important that we understand that this is a big claim saying that something is virtual, saying that something is the best time of the year in the sight of Allah, just ascribing something to the deen of Allah, saying Islam says this, Allah said this, the Prophet ﷺ said this. This is in reality something which is a big claim because you now are speaking on behalf of Allah. And it's important that we only ascribe to Islam that which is from Islam. So we can't just turn around and start saying things as we please. And for you new Muslims or the younger brothers that are new to practicing the deen, it's important that you understand that whenever somebody ascribes something to Islam, we have to ask, is this in the Quran? Is this in the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam? If we're saying we're going to get closer to Allah by doing a certain deed, then we have to be able to establish that from our religion. And if we don't do this, we are in we are choosing or we are we are choosing for islam to be forgotten in its true and purest form because if everybody starts adding to islam as they please and attributing to islam as they please then the reality is the true message the prophet left behind as a gift of guidance for the whole of mankind is going to be forgotten so when we say something is from Islam, and of course sometimes the intentions are good, but we need to make sure that that's something which is actually from Islam. It's actually from the Quran. It's from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the first virtue is that these are the best 10 days of the entire year. The second virtue is that in these 10 days, the good and righteous deed is more beloved to Allah in these 10 days than the rest of the year, meaning the reward is multiplied. As the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا مِنْ أَيَّامٍ الْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ فِيهَا أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْ هَذِهِ الْأَيَّامِ That there are no days, there are no days in the entire year that the righteous deed is more beloved to Allah than these 10 days. So again we, again we understand the importance of Allah's mercy and how generous he is in reality that he has made these days and he didn't have to but they are more beloved to him and if we do a righteous deed in these days the reward is multiplied the Sahaba asked the Prophet in the same hadith not even the one that makes jihad the Prophet said not even that person that makes jihad except for the one that loses everything in the battlefield meaning his life and his wealth He's the one that can come close to this reward, showing us the great opportunity that we have in front of us. That this opportunity is not something which is small, and it's not something that we can afford to be heedless of. 
These next 10 days are serious days where we have to struggle and strive to worship Allah as much as we can. From the virtues of these 10 days is that Allah mentions them in the Quran. And as we know, what Allah only mentions that which is important. In some places, Allah will tell us in the Quran of their importance and that they're the time of Hajj. And He'll encourage us to increase in His worship, in particular, His remembrance. In one place, Allah mentions, لِيَشْهَدُوا مَنَافِعَ لَهُمْ وَيُذْكُرُوا اسْمَ اللَّهِ فِي أَيَّامٍ مَعْلُومَاتِ أَلَى مَا رَزَقَهُمْ مِنْ بَهِيمَةِ الْأَنْعَامِ So that they may witness that which is of benefit to them. Talking about the people when they go for Hajj. And that they may increase in the remembrance of Allah in the well-known days. The well-known days here, according to the scholars of a tafsir from the Sahaba, like Abdullah bin Abbas and other than him, have all said that this is referring to the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. So the fact that Allah not only mentions them in the Quran, but He tells us about their virtue, and He tells us that this is a time for us to increase in His worship, is something that should motivate us all. At other times in the Quran, we find when Allah speaks about these 10 days, He takes an oath by them, where He says, Wal Fajr wa layalin ashr, where He takes an oath by the time of Fajr and by these 10 days. Now we know that Allah is only ever going to take an oath for us to try to comprehend that this is something serious, that which is going to talk about is something of great importance. And at the same time, he's only going to take an oath by something which is serious and important. And as we know, we can only swear by Allah. But Allah can swear by whatsoever he wills. He takes an oath by many different things in the Quran. But us as Muslims, we only take an oath by Allah. So we find that Allah makes reference to these ayah, to these 10 days in different places in the Quran. From the virtues of these days is that it, the ninth day is the day of what? The day of Arafah. And this has many virtues in and of itself. It's the most important day of Hajj. It's the day of forgiveness. Where the Prophet told us it's the day that Allah comes down to the lowest heavens, the closest that we, that we are to Him. And He asks the angel, why have all these people gathered in this state? wearing the same clothes, disheveled, tired. Why have they gathered? And the angel, and of course he knows, but he's giving them virtue by mentioning them. And the angels will say, they have come here to seek your forgiveness. And Allah will say, because of this state that they are in, I forgive every single one of them. Showing us that the day of Arafah is the most important day of Hajj. And it's the day of his forgiveness. And also we find it's the day that the du'a is accepted. As the Prophet ﷺ told us, uh, the best du'a that one can make is the, 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 the du'a of the day of Arafah. And the best du'a that me and the other prophets and messengers made was La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la lahul mulk wa lahul hamd wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. This is the best supplication talking about the tawheed and the oneness of Allah and how everything belongs to him and how he is over all things capable and how all praise belongs to him and him alone so it's also the day of dua also the Prophet told us about this one day of Arafah that the person that fasts on that day who's not making Hajj this inshallah has the reward of having the sins of the previous year and the sins of the coming year to be forgiven So this is something we should all strive to do to fast on the day of Arafah for those that are not making Hajj. Also we find that this is the day on the day of Arafah was the day that Allah perfected and completed his religion. And we learn this from that which Imam Bukhari and Muslim mention that a Jewish man came to Umar ibn Khattab may Allah be pleased with him and said to him O Amir al muminin you as Muslims have a verse that was sent to you in your book. If we, as the Jewish community, had this verse revealed to us, 
we would have taken this day as a day of Eid, as a day of celebration. Umar asked, which verse is this? And he told him, it was the verses where Allah says, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورديت لكم الإسلام دينا that today I have completed your, my, your religion for you and I have completed my favor upon you and I am happy for you to take Islam as your way of life Umar al-Ghattab may Allah be pleased with him he said I know where this verse was revealed and the circumstances of it being revealed he said it was on a Friday, on the day of Arafah, when the Prophet ﷺ made his hajj, these verses were revealed to him. So this was the day that Allah completed his religion. How many hajj did the Prophet ﷺ make in his life? He made one hajj. What year was the hajj revealed? What year did hajj become part of Islam? Final year. Anything else? Anything different? The Hajj became part of Islam, became legislated in the ninth year. The Prophet ﷺ made Hajj in the tenth year, but the year before that it was legislated. But the Prophet did not make Hajj because he was busy dealing with the different delegations from across the Arabian Peninsula and he was giving them da'wah they would come to visit him and learn about Islam the different tribes and he was teaching them about the religion of Islam but he did send a delegation of Sahaba that was led by Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and there's many different Sahaba in that delegation and it was announced at that Hajj that this is the last time that the Mushrikeen of Mecca are going to be able to make Hajj and the year after that the Prophet ﷺ came and he made Hajj and on the day of Arafah these verses that I mentioned to you in Surah Ma'idah, the third verse, was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. And after these verses were revealed to him, he only lived for a very short time. Who can tell me how long the Prophet lived after these verses were revealed? Three months. Anything else? It was 80 days. Prophet passed away 80 days after this. And we're going to be looking at the Prophet's passing away uh, further on in the course, inshallah, when we learn about Salah. But the point here is, this was the, one of the virtues of the day of Arafah, something that we need to ponder over, is that Allah chose this time to complete and perfect his religion for us. From the virtues of Dhul Hijjah is that we are supposed to ponder as Allah encourages us in the Quran we are supposed to ponder over Allah's favors upon us and we understand this from where he says and increase in your remembrance of Allah in the well known days speaking about the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah for that which he has provided for you, including uh, that which is given you from cattle that you're going to slaughter and sacrifice. So in these days, we're supposed to ponder and reflect over Allah's favors upon us. And at the same time, we're supposed to give that, that, that sacrifice. And of course, from the virtues of the Hijjah is the actual sacrifice that we make, which is... Um, us following the sunnah of the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam as we know from his story he was somebody that was tested with not having children until he became really old and he was tested throughout his entire life you look at the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam and perhaps in the future we can speak about this some of the lessons that we learn from his life subhanallah you find he was tested throughout his entire life and Allah gave him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to get closer to him. Up until he became the Khalil of Allah, the intimate friend of Allah. Because he sacrificed and went through every test and trial. And he saw that as an opportunity to get closer to Allah. 
So we learn that when he was blessed with his son Ismail, Allah ordered him to sacrifice that son, to make another sacrifice. And straight away, as we learn in Surah Safat, he sacrifices him. And Allah replaces that with the, with the ram or the sheep. And from there, that's where we take this ibadah of sacrificing. And the Prophet came and he sacrificed himself and he made it part of our hajj as well. So from the recommended acts of worship that we perform is sacrificing uh, in these first 10 days. With regards to some of the other deeds that we can do, then like I mentioned, these are all opportunities for us to increase in our reward and get closer to Allah and cleanse our souls. So we should be increasing in all of the deeds that we, be, that we should be doing anyway. So increasing reading the Qur'an, making du'a, increasing in our salah, uh, and giving in charity, all the different ibadah that we're supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be doing more, increasing in those ibadat. From those deeds that we should be aiming to do is fasting on the day of Arafah. As the Prophet told us, it's a means to have our sins forgiven for the year that has passed and the year that's going to come. At the same time, we find reports from the Prophet's wives, may Allah be pleased with them all, that the Prophet ﷺ would fast the first nine days. When he was not on Hajj, he would fast the first nine days. So fasting the first nine days is also something which is recommended and of great benefit, in particularly the Monday and Thursday fasts. Um, of course, like we mentioned, sacrificing is something which if we have the ability, we should try to do. And if we are going to sacrifice, then don't cut your nails or your hair up until the animal, animal has been sacrificed. Um, unless there's a need or a necessity for you to remove that hair or that nail. Or if you forget, there's no problem with that also. There's no problem with that also. And the sacrifice has to be done after the Eid Salah has to be done after the Eid Salah. Can't do it before. So if you're going to send it abroad or get some of the charities here to do it for you, uh, get that point clarified. That is going to be done after the Eid Salah and not before. From the ibadat that Allah encourages us to do at these times is making a dhikr, is remembering Allah. And of course, there's that dhikr which is general, Prophet told us when these first 10 days come, increase in your tasbih, your subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. This is something which we're supposed to increase in. And then there's that which is specific, which is the takbirat. From the, from the day of Arafah up until the day of Eid, where we are going to, be, where we make the takbirat, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar alhamd. We increase in that as well after the salawat um, from the acts of worship that we should be doing in these 10 days is making dua like we mentioned the Prophet told us that these 10 days are the best days that we can make dua in and the Prophet told us that the best dua that me and the prophets that came before me made was la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la lahul mulku wa lahul hamd wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir and also we find in ending, I mentioned this point, that we have to remember that we are now in the summer holidays. And we are responsible, as we are throughout the year, we are responsible over our children and their nurturing, nurturing them and their upbringing and the tarbiyah that we give them. So these 10 days, we should be increasing in acts of worship as a family and increasing the ibadat that we do as a family and bringing life to Islam in our houses in an easy and in a soft way and making it, encouraging, encouraging them to do good deeds and making it fun and interactive. And at the same time, Eid is going to be fast approaching. It's important that we make the most of Eid and bring life to these celebrations and use these opportunities to instill the correct belief and the correct Iman into our children. Because you find, unfortunately, our children sometimes are more content and are more happy with um, Christmas and Easter to celebrate. 
And one of the reasons of that is because we have, we have been neglectful and been heedless in making sure these events are special for our children and that they're, they are being fulfilled spiritually and that they can enjoy themselves. This is what I wanted to present here today and truly Allah knows best. If you guys have any questions until the Adhan, um, you, can, you can ask now inshallah. Uh, what time the Adhan, uncle? Quarter past? 20 past. Okay, we've got time. Say that again, sorry. No. That's talking about Surah Fajr. Well, Fajr wa layal in Ashar is talking about the first 10 days of the Hijjah, as Abdullah bin Abbas and other Sahaba mentioned. And Allah knows best. The sacrifice, um, whoever has the ability to sacrifice, then he should do so. It's not a wajib, it's not an obligation. Um, whoever has the ability should do so. And if somebody does it on behalf of his household, then that's something which is good also. I mean, what I mean by able is you have the financial means to do so. Say it again. No, uh, the, the person himself will know if he's financially capable of sacrificing. I mean, in this country, we're not going to um, take the take the sheep to our houses and slaughter ourselves. <laughs> what I mean by able is financially able. Like he has the ability to spend, uh, give it to one of these charities if we're gonna do it here or do it abroad. Yeah, you can sacrifice on behalf of your late father, inshallah. With regards to which one's better, sacrificing here or sacrificing in another country, the Prophet ﷺ himself would sacrifice in his own region and he ﷺ would keep some of the meat for himself, distribute some to the close neighbors and then he would also give to the poor. The reality is um, the, the homeless people that we have here in the city I think perhaps giving them a bag of meat is not the most um, best thing to do in the sense that if they're homeless, they're not going to have anywhere to cook that meat. Um, at the same time, when it comes to neighbors and things, because it's a time of Eid, everybody's freezers are going to be full anyway, right? So um, sometimes the meat's just going to go off and it's just going to be wasted. So it may be better to give it to somewhere um, abroad where there's a need for it or if you're going to do it here in the UK then give it to like a like a food bank for an example that cooks that meat and has like a soup kitchen that they can give it out the most ideal thing is giving it to a soup kitchen that can cook that meat and they can serve it out on to, to, to the people that are in need, that's the most ideal thing if that's not an option then personally and of course all knowledge and wisdom is with Allah, I personally think um, give it to another country where they're in where they're in dire need of it and Allah knows best al fadl tazid nam kadhalik الذنب في هذه الأيام أسوأ بالكثير لأنها أيام الفضل والطاعة فمن شعائر الله أن تؤذم هذه الأيام فلا ينبغي الإسراء في هذه الذنوب والإلم عند الله
Okay, we stop here for them. With regards to fasting, then from my from my knowledge is that there's the reports on based on the prophet's life indicate two things. The majority of the prophet's wives, they said the Prophet fasted, meaning all nine days. Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, said no, that's not the case. So if somebody wants to fast nine days in one go, they can. If somebody wants to do the Monday and Thursday in Arafah, they can do that also. So the, the, the issue is wide, inshallah. Dave, the next week. What did I say last week, sorry? I don't remember saying that. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think we discussed. With regards to the prophets and messengers, then they are ma'soom, they are faultless and sinless um, with regards to when it comes to um, conveying the risala yeah they don't make any mistakes with regards to that I mean in reality it's not counted because as we as we took last week it was something that Allah completely forgave Adam alayhi salam for Right? So it's, it doesn't go against Adam in any way. But rather, Adam making that mistake was something that we learned great lessons for. And hopefully, we took some of them last week, inshallah.